welcome to this webinar on linking GSA with Rhino and Grasshopper and I'm pleased to say we've got John Merchant with us today who is the owner and creator of Geometry Gym which is a program which does exactly um, all those links for you and he'll explain all about that in a moment. I'm quite looking forward to it. John, I'm going to pass over to you. Thanks very much for the introduction, Pete, and uh, it's nice to have the opportunity to speak uh, about GSA and the, the COM interface and a bit about the background work that I've been for about five years now or even a little bit longer with, um, with, with the tool development or analysis and, and, and trying to program with, with GSA. Just a quick background to myself. So I actually also, from a strong engineering background, but I studied a computer science degree as well, um, which was, gave me some training in, in writing lots of scripts and spreadsheets and bits and pieces to do model exchange. Um, I started quickly, first of all, with Connor Wagner, who now Oricon down in Melbourne, and then moved to Melbourne, uh, sorry, moved to London about 2005 uh, when I started working um, with GSA at Expedition Engineering. Um, project experience, just to give some insight or background, and, and sort of these were, were, were strongly used in the evolution of the tools that, that, that I'm really working on today. Lots of sports stadia and bridges, um, Wembley Stadium, the 2012 Velodrome, which was analysed in, in, uh, and designed in GSA, the uh, Melbourne Cricket Ground Northern Stand Redevelopment, again the roof cable net was, uh, was analysed and, and, and checked in, in GSA, and then uh, the, the Infinity Bridge, so lots of geometric um, projects. Uh, the nice thing with stadia and bridges from an engineering perspective is that the uh, structure becomes a, a significant part of the architecture and lots of effort going into the form and, uh, and how we um, set out the project and, and make it successful um, to budgets and but still get the high performance results. So I'm going to talk a lot today about GSA um, in terms of the user interface or the programming interface to drive it and then we're also going to take a look at the tools where I've been using the uh, com command line or the programming interface to basically provide an alternate user interface to GSA. So um, those that have used GSA and I'm going to show quite a bit live so please do just excuse me if, uh, if, if things don't quite go to plan but uh, so GSA, is those that are hopefully all, most of you are users of it, will be familiar or like all sorts of software, there's generally the user interface forms of menus at the top of the screen um, and some, some buttons to access some of the functionality that can then pull up other dialogues and that type of um, thing in terms of then making the models and then extracting the results and, and how we actually can uh, display graphically uh, various uh, aspects of the analysis or the results or the, or the design results that we're driving in software like this. Um, when you're actually trying to do set out things like the 2012 velodrome um, with, with the ge geometry, then initially a lot of spreadsheets um, certainly was, was a, a really good way of, of trying to, to, to transform the, the, the geometry calculations or the set out into into the uh, into the you know structural analysis model definition that then is used for the for the solver engine to solve for the displacements and the stresses and the re reactions and all the other results that we're, we're interested in from a structural perspective of how the project might perform. Now, um, GSA, like most software, then has basically if you do a save as on a, on a menu, then it has the binary file format. But those that might have also looked at it would would know that there's the GWA the text file format of, of this file. And, uh, and then that's a good way of interacting with spreadsheets and scripts and bits and pieces because uh, instead of binary just being all zeros and ones, we can actually as humans try and read what the data is. If you've, uh, if you've looked at this sort of interaction with GSA, then GSA provides quite conveniently the gateway, which we can actually copy all the model data that exists in our project at the moment. And then we can either open it in a spreadsheet or a text file format, I should have perhaps used WordPad for the uh, for the new line delimiting of, of, of this data. But uh, you will notice, maybe I'll quickly start, start WordPad, um, that, that it is basically um, the GWA data is framed in the way that there's a key keyword which identifies what each line of text represents and then the, the attributes of, of that data which then follow. So we can see here various section property analysis or data. We can see here that this is calling up a catalog section which is a UC. If we scroll back up through the data, we'll find nodes which have X, Y, Z coordinates. Some of these nodes will be restrained, so they'll have some extra data fields which will show whether it's a, a fully uh, flexure 
restraint or a, a, a translation restraint or any combination thereof. And then if we scroll down a bit further again, and this is probably a slightly a big model to have, have, have used this as a demonstration, but you'll find the elements, um, including whether they're a beam or a tie, which nodes they connect to. If it's not a, if it's a, a beam element, then it might, would have an orientation angle or an orientation node um, and a, a member releases and, and, and all those sorts of characteristics. So if you have looked through the, the, the tables, obviously, so we, GSA has the tables, but you can actually also um, interact with the model. Of course, also the tables provide another convenient way of, of using spreadsheet interaction. So we can copy and paste over the top with, with the data um, just using the table format, or you can actually use the gateway to copy data in a text file format and paste data in a text file format to actually construct the, uh, the, the structural analysis data without using all the, the toolbars and menus that, that, that do exist. So um, where that becomes interesting then is actually then how do we drive um, GSA from, uh, from other software? Okay, also just, to, I, I wanna just quickly, uh, and we will get onto the grass up in a second, but just, just quickly demonstrate some of the ways to learn this if you're not so familiar with it. But, and, and this basically describes the process that I've used to, to develop the tools um, for, for, for interacting with, with, Grasshop, uh, with GSA from our external environment, such as, as Grasshopper. If you want ex an explanation of actually what all those keywords are and in the order of the data that, that, are, uh, that, that are explained or listed behind it, then under the help menu of GSA, you can scroll down and see GSA text for the ASCII file help. And then you can see here individually explained um, what the arguments or parameters are for each of these lines of data. You can go down to the index at the bottom so you don't have to scroll all the way through. And so here, here this explains from that gateway text data, or if you've saved out to a GWA file, how to sort of as a human interpret what the, uh, what the data is that's contained in that information. Okay, um, so a lot of the uh, structural analysis software or all sorts of software, Office, um, even browsers and, and all sorts of applications that we use on our computers have their user interface or they will have something that's commonly referred to as an application programming interface or a software development kit. And basically this means we can drive software from other software with minimal manual intervention from the user that's actually sitting in front of the, uh, of the computer. Um, again, if you're actually interested in trying to write this sort of interaction yourself, rather than just, just use a tool or a developer like myself, then again, a good way to start is actually with the uh, or GSA, when you install it, does have a number of example um, and, and uh, scripts and explanations that come with it. So actually the path is, I think, being cut off here in my slide, but uh, it's, 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 it's located in the, in the program files folder. So I'm using 64 bit here, but if here it will be under, I think C program files, um, Oasis GSA, and then under the samples, you will find this API and GWC folder. And you can see here, there's a couple of uh, spreadsheets and um, you, can, you can actually, yeah, so you can use VB script. You're actually quite flexible in terms of the number of languages which can actually interact with the software. So here I've opened one of the spreadsheets in advance and you'll see a number of tabs here that actually then um, can interact with, with the GSA software. So th this gives again some, some, some descriptions about, about um, how, how, how to actually interact with the software. So here in this, in this spreadsheet, I'm gonna click on the get version button and you can see here that it's interacted with the, the Oasis software and then found all the library versions of, of, what the, uh, of what's installed on that computer. So you could check against it if, if you needed to. Now, how do we actually in this spreadsheet find that macro or the, the script which actually ran that, um, executed that code? If we click under, um, under I think it's under, uh, I've lost it. Uh, data, is it? Uh, macros here, under view macros, you can say click on view macros and then here we can see actually the, the number of pre-prepared GSA functions that were prepared for us. So GSA version was the one there that we just ran. We can say edit. And again, then you can see here in the VB script, the actual code that's interacting with the software to actually give that result. Um, and so that's a good, a good way to learn is actually by editing someone else's scripts to start with, just to become familiar with, with what that is. 
also as another means of doing it, not from a spreadsheet, Microsoft Visual Studio is a good way of doing it. There's the express version of it, which is free if you're not actually building um, software to use for commercial um, sales and things like that. And just to quickly demonstrate again, also from a, a programming perspective, how to drive DSA is that I can just set up a, a new Windows application um, and then basically to, to demonstrate the, the process, we just need to tell this, so if I add a button quickly here, we, we need to test, or uh, and if I click on the, on the code, um, then we actually can interact the, uh, in, tell, tell, tell this uh, Visual Studio project that we want to interact with the, with the, with the GSA code. So, um, sorry, this control's just in the room. I'll just start a new, a new, um, a new class. Okay, so the first thing we'd actually do is is add a reference. Slip this out of the row. Okay, I'm I'm gonna um, first of all, if you actually want to tell it that you want to interact with with the GSA libraries or other particular libraries, we can click on the add reference um, menu here in the Solution Explorer, and then um, we can we can uh, under the com list of com libraries. We should be able to scroll down and then we should find the Oasis GSA library. So I think it's under O for Oasis. You can see the Windows does install, it was under G for GSA. Okay, we can see here GSA 8.6 type library. So I've got GSA 8.6 installed here. And then we can click OK. Uh, and then that will add this interaction or the, the ability to interact with, with, that, uh, with that particular library on the on the uh, on the uh, on, on the project, so I, I'm going to say then that I want to using. Uh, sorry, I'll just find where the here. If we look under or browse the library, okay, we can okay. So the library, the the, the base class is the interop.gsa8.6. The nice thing about using Visual Studio is that then once you've actually linked to that to that class. We should get um, autofill commands and things like that start to. Um, sorry, one second. I'm just going to add a button and then add the add the uh, thing to make sure this class that I just created was part of this code. Okay, so here I'm going to try and now add that I'm going to reference the GSA using GSA 8.6. Okay. Uh, and now here in that control, I should be able to say GSA or GSA dot GSA com auto. Or, so this is basically a handle to the application that will run in the class. Okay, and then just as an example, we should be able to say we want to open a file and then give a string which represents the file path. Okay, and we can save the file and we can do that type of thing. Now, to just to quickly also demonstrate then, if we actually want to generate a node or a beam or something like that here with the, uh, with, with the COM interface, then there's a GWA command. And basically what that's going to want is, is a command that looks something like set node and then something like the node number and then the X, Y, Z coordinates. So that's where actually learning all that GWA command data becomes useful. Um, in terms of actually then trying to, to send that data from this type of environment to the, uh, the GSA application. Okay. Okay, so as I said, for, for the common interface and trying to get started with interacting with GSA in, in, in this type of way, then as I said, a good way to start is by studying the examples that, that Oasis have prepared and, and, and installed with the application. So you can see the spreadsheet that we looked at. There actually, I think we're actually a couple of uh, Visual Studio projects also that were shipped there in that folder. And then of course, hopefully this resource might be a good way of looking back and just seeing some of the quick steps in terms of establishing the project about, uh, about how to actually set up that type of project. Um, a couple of quick, hints on this type of thing from, from my own, uh, own um, experiences with, with running this. Sometimes, or if the, if the, particularly sometimes if you have multiple versions of GSA, 
and you need to actually interact with one version over another or um, in the past as well, sometimes it hasn't quite managed to find that com um, library when, you, when you're trying to search for it. And there is a little utility there in the C program files folder, which you can run to register the, the GSA com library. So I think it's under Oasis GSA. Um, and then if we scroll down, there's this GSA register utility. So if you are finding some problems in terms of, um, of the com library being recognized or your, your compiled assembly or spreadsheet not interacting with the GSA application, definitely that the first thing to test is running that application, the GSA register to see if it fixes it. When we actually interact with the GSA application, there's, there's two modes that it can operate in. And one is if the application has been started manually by the user, then that um, the, the, uh, the common library or example is similar as running the Grasshopper plugin that we're gonna look at in a second. Um, if the GSA application has already started, then the uh, COM library should latch on to that version of the application, and then the model should basically be in a, a manual or a visible state that the user can also interact with the, with the model in that environment. If the user doesn't have GSA running, then what the COM library will do is start the application in a background service state. Okay, so it can run as a background server. All the di user dialogues and things that you normally see will be suppressed. Um, or, or at least 99% of them. Um, and so you can basically just use GSA as a background solver without any manual interaction with it at, at, at all. So, um, so it depends on the mode and whether you, if you're trying to run 100 models and or in sequence, or whether it's just one model that you, you're also, particularly while you're debugging and testing um, your code or the, or the model that you're preparing, then probably having the application open before you start the, the COM interaction is a good idea. Um, there was just, a, I think, a couple of dialogues, and probably I haven't, I think most of them actually have been suppressed. But we might see in a second if we run a form finding example um, that if we, if we start a form finding um, analysis task, that if we do have the application open, we might just have to check if, if the thing seems to have frozen, go check the GSA application and make sure that there's not a dialogue waiting for you to click OK. That, um, that, to, to proceed onwards and or accept the, the state of the analysis or the, the changes that are about to occur. And I think the last thing um, that, that um, also um, some exceptions that started appearing when I first started trying to interact with uh, uh, GSA from Grasshopper was the first thing you should do in your, in your COM interaction code is set a new document. Um, so I didn't do that actually before in my example, but before you even open a document, I think there was a, a requirement to set a new document or a, 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 an exception did occur. So if you are seeing something um, when your project starts uh, trying to set, uh, adding a new document, even if you uh, close it straight away from the COM environment, um, that can be one way of overcoming that hurdle. I don't know, Pete, are there any questions just before we start on the Grasshopper side of things on, on what we've just explained or? Um, there's no questions come through so far. Okay, good. Well, as I said, as you said, we can, uh, we can um, field any questions at the end or um, on, on, on that nature of things. But um, I think we'll move on to the grasshopper side of things. Okay, so I'm just gonna start GSA as well. The other thing with GSA, if you try and interact it, with it, it uh, from multiple different compiled libraries, um, again, it might have an have a, a, a issue with that. So if, I'm just going to start it again because I want to now start interacting with it from the Rhino and Grasshopper environment. So I don't, I don't know how many um, out there are already using Rhino, but just explain quickly the background of Rhino and explain what Grasshopper is and why it might be a, a, a nice user interface for particular projects you might be working on. Uh, Rhino actually started as an AutoCAD plugin. Um, but what it basically brought to the table was the NURBS geometry. And anyone that knows or doesn't know what NURBS stand for, it stands for a non-uniform rational B-spline. And what that basically means is Rhino has a, a great ability at being able to, or uses a math, that mathematical um, geometry to actually be able to, to define curves and surfaces and then also be able to to apply all sorts of um, morphs and transforms and, and shearing, twisting, all sorts of geometry interactions uh, with that, with the geometry that it creates. But I think most people are aware of what a spline is. Um, a spline is basically a curve that's being directed towards control points. And again, Rhino has been quite popular for this because you can push and pull 
the geometry, whether I'm just doing a curve here, but you can do it in 2D with a surface out of plane as well. And you can sort of sculpt the geometry um, to, to pick up shapes and, and forms that, that you like. So, so um, yeah, they split as being an AutoCAD plugin um, quite a few years ago now, but you will notice that the user interface is very similar to AutoCAD. So you have various menus and, and buttons and, and then various controls, as I said, for doing more morphs and twisting and, and, and stretching and, and all sorts of, uh, of uh, manipulations on the geometry that you create. Okay, now like most CAD environments, um, the geometry is, is pretty primitive in terms of its self-awareness. So I'm actually just going to add some, uh, some point objects here to the Rhino document. Okay, and then I'm just going to use, the, again, similar to what I did with just moving my mouse around before, I'm going to say I want to interpolate these points and have a curve fit through these points. So I'm clicking on these points in turn. It has object snaps similar to AutoCAD. Um, and then there's menu options here for whether you want to close the curve or leave it open or um, undo some of the steps and things we've got. But you can see now that this curve has fit through those Rhino points that I created, but it doesn't really have a sense of history. So the curve doesn't have the self-knowledge that it was actually formed by finding its path through these points. And if I start shifting them round, you can see the curve remains unchanged. Now, it's not quite fair to say that Rhino doesn't have a history, um, history tree or a knowledge of, of the sequence or steps that you use to create that. There actually is a record history button down here. But again, that actually doesn't work for all the commands. So, um, so what they started developing, and uh, generative modeling or par parametric modeling has been around for, for quite some time. Certainly generative components in Bentley has been uh, a very popular um, environment for doing a very similar thing. But it's, it's basically a graphical programming environment. And what we'll see here is, is all sorts of menus and commands, very similar to the operations that we can do in Rhino. But what we're going to capture instead is the, is the process of actually generating, or the, the actual modeling process. Um, and, and one of the big reasons we'd like to do capture the process is because we, as our designs and projects change and evolve, whether it be changes in client briefs or engineers telling us things need to get bigger or smaller or um, change of scope or we just didn't like the shape or whatever else it might be, obviously there's all sorts of cost implications and things and, and projects change all the time. And so the problem in, in, with lots of CAD environments is that every time a change occurs, then what we have to do is we have to go back um, find what um, objects in that model weren't affected by that change or what were, and then either delete them and recreate them, or we would uh, modify them and do lots of trimming and chamfering or, or, or whatever, whether reflects to update the model for, for the, the new scenario, the new optional design that we're going to pursue. So um, rather than then obviously repeat the same manual modeling tasks time and time again, then uh, what we what we can do is actually capture the, that modeling step here in this in this uh, programming environment called Grasshopper. So I'm going to do the same thing to start with, just to demonstrate. Now Rhino and Grasshopper. Grasshopper is a plugin de developed by uh, David Rutten, who is an employee of the of McNeil, who do develop Rhino. Um, but um, so it's operating basically as its own standalone plugin interface. And here, first of all, you can use a, a hybrid modeling approach. So I can use these points that I created here in the Rhino document. I'm just going to add this component from the uh, input collector to the Grasshopper canvas. And then I'm going to right click on it and say set multiple points. And then I'm just going to click on these points in the, in the Rhino document in turn um, and, and, and then basically associate those data with the, with the, with the, the Grasshopper script that I'm going to create. You can see the little um, red cross, which is now appearing on those points. And you can see when you click on a component in Grasshopper, it goes green or it's red if it's unselected. Or again, you can actually override what colors you prefer for that type of uh, behavior. But what, what we're going to do now is basically build up a graphical programming script um, to, to do um, some of this type of routine or, or, or check. So I'm going to first of all fit the curve through those points. Okay, so similar to what I did with my menu here to find curve, interpolate points. Under my curve menu here in Grasshopper, under spline, then I can find the interpolate um, um, curve or interpolate point component. I can drag that onto the canvas. And what you can see is that most components are either a data generator or a data collector. 
or they have a function or a method that they will apply to the data. So every component basically that does a function has inputs on the left hand side and outputs on the right hand side. And then this is, it looks like a little circuit wiring diagram that you can basically, if you hover your mouse over near the nib of this output on the right hand side, you can see the mouse changes to become this uh, spline. And then I can basically attract to an input of another component or a calculation. So you can see now that the, the, his, this is showing the, the wire, the connectivity of this diagram. And we do have a parametric um, history now to this. If I start shifting the points around here, it's updating the X, Y, Z coordinates of these points in Rhino in the Grasshopper script. And then we've captured this modeling step that we want to have a, uh, a, a curve fit through these points. Okay, now there's all sorts, you can see here, we can get three outputs. One is the curve, one is the length of the curve, and the other is what's known as the domain of a NURBS curve. So it's basically a parametric expression. Um, mostly it starts from zero to another number, but it's not um, guaranteed to be that. But uh, again, that probably not so important for the exercise or explanation today. What we can do also then is, is basically add some more controls and, and effects to this type of curve. Okay, so here I have a Boolean toggle control and I can double click here in the true or false box and have that then update to say, uh, or export a true or false value. Now, I've got a periodic input here and what the periodic input basically means is, is the curve closed or not? Okay, and you can see now if I toggle that input or output, it changes the state of the curve that's created in terms of whether it's closed or not. One other thing on that, if I go back quickly to the Rhino documents, I can't select that curve that's being created. It's, it's, it's just being virtually displayed here in the, in the, in the, in the um, Rhino viewport. Okay, now there's this process called baking, where if I click on a component, click on this or, so space bar or middle mouse bar button on that component, I can click on this fried egg button, and now what I have is actually the curve which is, has been created from that grasshopper script. But when I, and that could have been created just the same as I created the curve manually before. But what you'll also note now is that it, that static or baked object has lost its association with the Grasshopper script. So now the virtual version of it, the green version is still being updated, but that version that I, I baked or made uh, inserted into the Rhino document remains static and, and, and doesn't have its own self knowledge of that history. Okay, now that's a very simple example. And actually I'm quickly gonna scale this out because what we're gonna start doing in a second is how do we actually turn this data into a GSA model? Okay, now I'm gonna, um, first of all, I'm going to do, just quickly do a little bit more in native grasshopper. Well, I'm quickly here on this input. You, you can note actually it has all sorts of fancy controls. I don't know how we'd actually link a calendar into the, into the GSA, although maybe we might do construction sequence or stage analysis or something like that sometime. Um, there's clocks. There's also um, some, some graph mappers and things like that. So I can set a graph type to be, sorry, I missed that, graph type to be maybe a Bezier spline. And what we can basically do is wire numeric values in here and then have the mathematical relationship with the, the curve that we're creating update to the numbers that get output. So again, for, for, for sort of concept and, 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 uh, and trying to graphically or um, interact with our model data, it's quite a, a good way of doing it. Um, there's also things like a, a control knob for a stereo. David studied architecture at Delft and, and it's certainly taken a lot of care in the user interface and, uh, and how, how, um, how, how the user can interact or, or, or do that, uh, generate their data or, or parametrically or generatively to define their model. Number sliders are also a very, very popular one. For this example, I'm gonna change it to an integer slider instead of a decimal number. And maybe I'll just make it so that it varies from zero to 20 instead of zero to one or something like that. But what you'll see here is then um, that I can take this little diamond in the middle of the slider and shift it from left to right to change what the numeric value is that's being transmitted from this number slider. So let's start to build this grasshopper definition up a little bit. So maybe I want some division points and scattered equally along that curve. So again, under the curve menu, under division, I'm gonna say I wanna divide the curve. You can see we could divide by distance or divide by length, um, whether it's the length along the curve or basically the intersection with a, 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 a circle of a set radius. 
Okay, so I'm going to wire the curve in to be the input for the division. And if we hover over the input here, I can see by default, David set this to have 10 division points along its length. Okay, and then there's an option here again for a true false value for whether you want to split or have a division point at any discontinuities along that curve. Now I can actually change and wire my number slider up to the number of division points. And you can see now as I start to change the number of division points along that curve, we can see extra crosses being generated um, along, that, uh, along the length of it. Well, I think one of the reasons why Grasshopper has become very popular um, is that it has a very uh, real-time feedback to all these results and things. So it's like programming, but we actually get real-time debugging without compiling um, and then trying to trace the code using the, a debugger in Visual Studio. So here we can see the, all the X, Y, Z coordinates of all the points that we've created. Um, and, and again, you can see the tangent vector. And, and I think that is one of the reasons why, as we actually build the model, we can debug it in real time and test it, and, and then hopefully quickly react if we're actually not quite getting the results that we want. Um, so the next step I'm gonna do is actually, let's say we wanna make some columns along the edge of this curve. Okay, so I'm actually gonna use a component here which says it creates a line and it takes a starting point, a direction vector, and a length. Okay, so I'm gonna add um, the points to here to be the start point. By default, it's set to be in a vertical direction, so a, a, a zero, zero, 001 vector. And the length at the moment is only set to be one. So I've got a millimeter document um, open here in Rhino. So each of these lines that it's actually creating at the moment are only one millimeter long. So we're struggling to see them at this particular scale. But again, actually, maybe I'll quickly copy this slider um, or, and, and then use a mathematical multiplier. So I'm gonna scale it by a thousand just to perhaps convert from meters to millimeters in this circumstance. And then I can use a numeric slider to, to control what the height of these columns are that we create. So I'm gonna um, apply that into the length. And now as I shift that slider back and forth, you should see these, uh, these columns growing by a meter at a time. Okay, now, uh, what, I, what we could do, and, uh, and certainly been done a lot, on, uh, particularly in early stages when I was modeling in projects as well, is we could actually bake this just to geometry, um, like the lines, and we could export it in Rhino. Rhino is very good at the number of file formats that it can save as, including DWG and DXF. And what we could do, is, and I know with, with GSA as well, we could actually bake things to different layers and then use that as a, as a means when we import in GSA using their libraries to assign different cross-section profiles and things to it. But um, obviously if we're changing this model all the time and wanting to assess lots of options, what could be more convenient is actually start to build the structural analysis attributes onto this within the, the Grasshopper platform. So you can, and you can download uh, my plugins and install them. And when you do, you'll get a couple of extra menus appear, or at least one extra menu appear on the, on, on the, end, of the uh, end of the Grasshopper interface. And what you can start to see here then is a whole bunch of GSA components. And what these all basically relate to are that GWA data. Um, it's normally one-to-one. -one. Some of them I've actually, because of the complexity, split them into a couple. But what we're basically gonna do is start generating the GWA text um, that we can then send automatically to the GSA with all sorts of attributes and, and, uh, and, uh, and relationships that we might want to set up. Um, first thing, if we were actually going to convert these things into column, is that we would like to basically set a, a, a section profile to it. So one of the components I did create so we don't have to go look up the dimensions all the time, and basically this is, is basically a very close copy to what you get in, in, uh, in GSA, is a, a, some pull down dialogues, which we could say whether we want a universal beam or universal column, and then find the size designation that we wanted to apply to this particular member. Okay, um, and again, actually you can set up standard shapes similar to the way that you can define standard shapes in GSA. Here we can have a component which would take the depth, breadth, width, web thickness, flange thickness, and a root radius if you're gonna consider it onto the, uh, onto the I beam profile or a universal beam. Okay, so having decided that this is, I'm gonna use the catalog profile that I've got here, then the next thing basically we, we would go look for is a component to actually create the beam. So there's a component here. One other thing actually that's quite nice, if you actually don't wanna go looking through all the menus for things, is you can double click on the canvas 
and then you can start typing in the component that you actually want. So if I start typing in something like create beam, I can see it being proposed up here at the top. I can click on it and then it's put that component there ready for me to start wiring the inputs in. Okay, so I'm going to wire the, link, the, the line in to be the, the node. or the, this, this has two overrides. One, it can take a center line curve or it can actually take two points or if we've created GSA nodes already um, to define what the start and end point of what that particular member is. It's still missing a few inputs. When you see an orange component, that's suggesting that it needs a little bit of extra data. And so here we can see that it's giving us a clue saying that a compulsory component was the property, the section property data. So here we've actually just got the section dimensions, but this doesn't tell it what material it is. Okay, so we can actually click on the create section property component. Okay, here. Okay, and this takes four inputs. The profile description, which here we can say is this catalog profile. Uh, the name for the property, which I can't remember if that's compulsory or not. Yes, I think it is. I'm just going to wire in the same thing. And then the material. And again, the, the standard uh, material libraries from GSA, which, uh, which we can use or we can create our own material. You can see there's also some, some components here. If you're doing fabric analysis or plate analysis, that you can set up some of the other material descriptions as well. Okay, so here I'm just going to say it's a standard material and I could pull up, you, everyone that's used GSA will recognize the, the five standard materials that, that comes with it. So I could wire the steel in for here and the component goes from orange to gray. Um, again, there's actually, so if we actually wanted to explicitly override what the Young's modulus was or nominate the thermal expansion characteristics and that type of thing, there's this component which could, which would give the user the, the freedom or flexibility to override what those characteristics might be. So I'm going to now start wiring this section property in to be the, the, the property. And you can see here now a preview here where we can see that that, that universal beam profile has been uh, been adopted along, along that. Remember this whole thing's parametric so that you can uh, change the number slider and uh, changing the number of columns which are being generated along this curve. Okay, and then quickly, uh, the process, well, one, we might want to put a node restraint, say, at the bottom node or at the points which are being directed along that curve. So I'm going to say GSA uh, create or find node. Okay, so I can wire in the point as the location that we want to detect where we want a GSA node because as it's created these columns, the, 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 the database will already have actually populated a structural analysis node at that location. And then we can have a GSA node attribute. So I'm going to say add node attributes. And in here, you can see we can have a restraint, a spring support, assign some of the other attributes like a color or a restraint access. Or if we also want to control the numbering of our nodes or elements, there are these attribute components where we could say the lowest acceptable node we want generated by this component is 100 or 200 or 1,000. Particularly if it's a, a high-rise building or something, it's common that we've used different numbering conventions. So we can say all nodes that start with 500 are on level five or something or a similar sorts of uh, interaction. So there's a couple of ways of generating the restraint. I can right click on that node restraint if it's X, Y, Z, or if it's also restrained against Fletcher, or you'll also find some components which actually have um, where you can wire in a Boolean result like we did before for the closed curve or not. And then you can wire that into the restraint if you want to set up um, different restraints based on different locations or different characteristics of where it is in the model. One other quick thing to note with this, hopefully it's easy to check the data that's being created in some ways, particularly as I said, if you understand the GWA framework. So if I actually wire the output or hover over the, 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 the data being created here, you should recognize that the, uh, the node is there, the node number, and then the X, Y, Z coordinates. My plugins all use meters in the background, even if the Rhino document is, um, is, is using a different, a different system. Um, and the little GGGH string you see there, if, maybe that might be if we uh, do a follow-up com um, programming type thing, that's just a, a user string being stored on that GSA data. And that basically helps me in revising the data when we update or, um, or, uh, or, or, or change the model again. 
One other thing, actually, I didn't mean, I meant to say, the normal opening dialogue you get with GSA prompting you for recently used documents and things, make sure that's suppressed as well, or otherwise the COM interaction um, can't really interact with the software. So it should, should be basically left in a state, basically waiting for a new document to be created. I'm going to now actually send this data to GSA. I mean, again, actually what we could do perhaps is, is, is change the orientation. Uh, doing manual orientations is something that actually can be quite difficult. So if I actually want to um, set that so that it's, um, sorry, I'm just going to set this again. If we wanted all these columns to orient their um, flat web to the, to the um, set origin of the model, then I'm going to take the coordinate at zero. And then I can wire this in as a point for the orientation. And what we should see happen is all these columns spin around. Actually, sorry, but, uh, yeah, it is. It's orienting the web um, towards each of it, to the orange, or origin node, which is in here. Now, so the process of, of, of sending that data to GSA is here under the Geom Jim menu under GSA um, is that we can find this blue fried egg button component here. This doesn't have to wire into anything. But basically, I can just double click in this, and you can see here a little bit of a summary printed in the Rhino background. And you can see the GSA model updated by COM, and we can see it created 18 nodes, and nine elements, and one section property, which is just slightly hidden, zero lists. Um, and so now, if we turn and go to our GSA application, so does this work? Yeah, here we go. Okay, I'm just going to flesh these things out, and you can see here that the members have been created at each of those positions with each of those orientations towards the origin. So, and if we quickly turn on the restraints, okay, you can see that pin restraint which has been created at each of these locations. Um, now, um, okay, so what we can do then is we can analyze it in GSA and we can, uh, we can, uh, or manually, or we can also, you maybe we do, you know, there are options. We're I mean, certainly not going to go through all the components today. But there are components here to generate loads. There's gen components here to generate plates or turn meshes into plates. Um, to generate the geometry like lines and areas and regions if we're doing uh, floor slabs. And we can also create, uh, create lists. Okay, so, uh, and then there's a second series of components here for the GSA components um, here that actually can generate loads, load cases, load case combinations. You can actually also basically, as I sort of mentioned before, execute GSA just as a background solver. And if we have time, we'll quickly open a couple of those models in a second, where we can actually execute the solver and then you can ex extract the results back into the GSA, uh, sorry, into the Grasshopper um, environment. So let's quickly check what the slides are that I have here or which models we might open. Um, well, I, wanna, I wanted to quickly talk about, so, you know, a, a, a project that we did use uh, GSA, as I said, extensively on more from Rhino than Grasshopper, as Grasshopper was still evolving at the stage. But, you know, the velodrome where we went through lots of options for the for the bowl and the roof. And so it wasn't just like we, we took one torus and set out the cables at a predetermined spacing and that was the design we ended up with. Um, obviously, there's various costs, including the enclosed volume for supplementary heating and cooling, the, the cost of the facade wrap. Um, around the outside, the cost of the steelwork itself in the bowl um, or the raker trusses, and then the cable net, making sure that the torus or the saddle shape that was determined from intersecting it with the curve around the, ra uh, the racing track, um, that it actually um, had enough depth, structural depth for the cables to be able to span at, 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 at a satisfactory spacing for the, for the panel sizes. So we did go through lots and lots of different variations of, 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 of this to try and fine-tune and optimize the design. The design team really wanted to make the velodrome a lot like a bicycle, um, as efficient as possible and minimal, but a really high performance uh, product. And so we did, you know, the, the architects actually did have a generative model. They did use generative components in Bentley. So they did actually generate a lot of the, the cable net positions and the and the roof or the, the bowl steel. And But then we were using processes to, um, in a similar way to what I've just sort of been showing in Grasshopper to use that to update the, the, the GSA model so we could assess the performance without having to spend lots and lots of time trying to manually move and sculpt all the uh, the nodes and, and elements into position for, for the next option that we were considering. Okay, um, now, so we can actually said, and we'll see whether we have time to, or maybe we'll open one or two of these. We can actually execute GSA 
Um, and Pete, these are examples that were taken from one of your early webinars on form finding. Um, so basically what I did was convert the, the exercises or models that Pete had created um, into Grasshopper scripts. And then we could, with probably a little bit more flexibility, vary some of the spans or the locations of some of the features. Um, this image down here in the bottom left-hand corner was uh, those that saw the Olympics, again, the, uh, the shooting pavilions um, done, I think, by Magma Architects and Mott McDonald's. Um, they were able to very quickly check the fabric or the effect of fabric of moving some of these protrusions and openings around um, and, 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 and basically get some, some real quick um, um, or assess options again to try and come up with the desired arrangement uh, and with the, the right visual appearance for, for, for those pavilions. So, um, uh, yeah, that did work quite well. The other thing, um, um, so maybe, well, maybe we'll see. Uh, uh, Pete, uh, what time, time do you want to go to? How long do you want the questions? Or um, Well, um, we'd, we'd like to keep it on, uh, to, to the hour, if, if possible. Okay. But, no, no, um, absolutely. Have you got many questions, or should I...? Um, we've got a um, couple of um, well, is it is a general question about whether the video will be uh, whether the webinar has been recorded, and say so, yes, I am recording the webinar at the moment, so we'll Good. be putting that online shortly. Uh, and there's a question as well: um, if the Rhino file is in millimeters, um, will the yeah. resultant GSA file be in millimeters as well, or will that always be in meters? Um, no, what I've what I've tried to do when it actually one one thing I meant to show as well, if you want to check when you've done that baking process, is that if you right click on this bake button, there's actually an option here for whether you want to take a summary of the model data that was sent to the clipboard. Okay, so I'm going to say commit changes to that, and let's just make the model a little bit different so we can see that we can actually, if the column spacing we decided was was far too sparse, let's add a whole bunch more columns to this model. Okay, so I can update that GSA model now again by double clicking on that component okay and then it's going to send that data to the clipboard and we should see a whole bunch now as i said all these additional columns now being generated here in the grasshopper script now if you actually bake that summary to the clipboard then one we can actually see all the data that was sent to gsa again as i said it helps if you sort of understand the, the gwa framework now here what you can see is i'm actually because i do use meters as my plugin background I have set the scale of the data that I'm sending to GSA to meters. But if we also scroll down to the very bottom, then what it will also do is, is actually update back with what the user had already opened. So you can obviously set your preferences in GSA, whether you want to work in feet or inches or millimeters. Um, and so what the plugin will do is it will revert that document back to the user setting. So it really then that's just you know adopting what the user preference is in GSA in terms of what gets left on the uh, on the GSA project. Excellent. And, and um, there's, there's just yeah, there's what one of the questions come in is um, asking about the compatibility between G, the GSA and Grasshopper versions. Yeah, it's a good question. I, I know actually now probably I haven't been so good at at, at doing that, but. Um, um, if you actually go to that help on the GSA um, GWA again, is that now the text data is actually being versioned. So actually, if, if the new version of GSA comes out, I think I'm trying to think of a good one. I think nodes or um, beams might be a good one. Okay, so if I quickly go to the help for the node data, you'll actually find that there's a version for node.1 or node.2, and that actually helps with with actually interacting with the in terms of the format of what this text data is with the different versions of GSA. Well, I, I do actually support normally back at least one or two versions. Um, because it uses the com libraries, that does become specific on the version of GSA that's installed. But you know, if you go to my downloads page, again, actually 8.6 has been around for some time. So I, I don't think there's a public link, at least for the 8.5 version. But um, but it is possible to interact with, with, with some of the different versions, but I don't, you know, I think I started about 8.1 when I first started using GSA. And I don't think the, da the data has changed too much to use with that version, but it is possible to interact with different versions of GSA if, if that's critical to the user. Excellent. Um, oh, Does that answer that question? Yeah. I think so, yeah. Um, now, um, also another question coming about um, 
the safeness of the geomet geometry data is the safeness of geometry data guaranteed in detail in the process generation of the structures from Rhino and Grasshopper to GSA? I think that means is can you be sure you get you're getting what you asked for? Well, and that's one of the reasons why that that summary to clipboard thing. I well, certainly when I was uh, when I'm using the tool, I find that quite useful in some ways. Is that um, you know you can actually look at every piece of data that was sent to the to the GSA application and see what it is. I, th these tools aren't a substitute. I mean, the thing I always say about computers is they're very fast, but they're very stupid. Um, you know, they have zero intelligence. So th using this type of tool or approach doesn't guarantee that you're going to get a, a, a you know a valid or a, a, a you know an appropriate model. What what hopefully these tools start doing though. Is giving the you know the engineer or the, the the designer more time to spend checking and validating the model themselves as well. So often, you know, if we're trying to assess different options of different projects, that we would uh, not, you know, we would not possibly be able to assess all the options. And, and you know, if it's going to take us two weeks to create a new model of, of a velodrome, um, and we don't have that time, then we can't consider that option. But so hopefully, what these sorts of tools start to do is actually bring more time to checking and. And thinking about actually is that the the right design, um, rather than spend all our time trying to create the model. So, but but I, I do think with GSA obviously we can you know it, it's it's you can check results, you can check reactions, you can check your bill of quantities. It, it's not trying to replace that type of uh, model um, supervision and, and model response from the user. What this is trying to really do, I guess, is create a different user interface. Which is more attuned to scripting or programming to generate the the type of project that you're you're trying to derive. Just just quickly on that as well, then. So, uh, or the last slide that I had here. So there actually, as I said, you can actually run the GSA solver in the background, and there is an interesting um, a, um, tool of Grasshopper as well called Galapagos, which uses a, a genetic algorithm or a, the survival of the fittest type theory where it can actually basically take a whole bunch of slider inputs and randomly change their positions into, into different permutations. And then basically if we took a characteristic, this is, and again, this is an example that users can download from my blog and test for themselves, um, is that it will actually, here this it has control of this trust and it can change how many vertical divisions there are and then the different section designations to it. And really uh, in this example, all I was trying to say is what is the maximum stiffness trust I could get, um, which obviously we just put as much steel on it as possible. Um, and really a more apt test would actually be, can we achieve this stiffness for the minimum weight of steel or the minimum cost of steel if we consider what the influence of connections and things might be. But um, it is a, an interesting tool and it did sort of, you know, obviously the answer did approach that the right thing where it just jammed as much steel in it as possible. Um, and it's useful if we can, the thing as I said though as well, computers are very fast, they just have zero intelligence and, and normally us as, as humans with, with brains and, and and experience, we can actually spot alternate better answers. Um, of course, a, a problem solver like this can only search the, the solution space that we give it. So um, again, it can be a very useful tool, but needs to be used very carefully in terms of the way that, that, that you take the results from it. And just because a computer gave us an answer doesn't mean we should accept it or accept that that is the actual best uh, answer that might be possible. Excellent, thanks. Um... Got a question here um, about licensing. Mm -hmm. um, do, do, you, do you have um, is your is your program free or or, 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 or is there a license involved? That's a very good question. The only reason I charge for it, of course, is so that I can work full time on on the development of the tool. Um, I do give it to free to students and academics for research. So um, so those that are not using it for commercial gains are, are very welcome to uh, to do that. Um, you can download the tools from my website, so the Ge Geometry Gym, which you can either do www.geometrygym.com slash downloads or geometrygym.wiki.downloads and you can scroll down and you'll find the, uh, the GSA installer here. I recommend also installing the Bullant um, plugin because it has the catalog profiles and that type of thing. And there's also some help here for guidance on installing if the installer doesn't work um, front up. Um, so I do charge commercial users. It is a floating license, so it can be shared amongst multiple users. But on that token as well, I do offer a month evaluation for users to test the plugin, so they can prove to themselves that it will save them a lot of time, which of course saves them a lot of money, um, or enables them to, to to pursue designs and options that they weren't previously been able to do. Excellent. Thanks. Um, 
you lose it. Uh, is it possible to create customized section catalog in Grasshopper? Oh, that's a very good question. I haven't tried that, Pete. So we, that might be a discussion. <laughs> we might. I, I can take note of that one and see. As I said, you can actually create standard shapes, um, but I actually haven't investigated to say actually whether then we could build the uh, database that GSA uses for um, catalog profiles. So we will. We, we can certainly think about that. Excellent. Okay. Um, how do you import the GSA results back into Grasshopper to, to check, for example, deflections and, and so on? Okay, so it uses the COM interaction, and we actually I didn't quickly go to the help on the COM interaction, which is under, I think, program fundamental, uh, program data, no, sorry, it's working with the program. Which one? Programming in command line interface. Oh, yes, yeah, sorry. Programming in command line interface, COM automation. Now what you can do in here, if you click in here, is also find the methods um, which actually um, which actually interact with actually telling GSA to, to, to start a task or extract results. So you can see here there are output functions. So is the, you have to search through, there's a text file for the non-standard one. You can extract some of the standard results. And if you actually want to extract specific results like stresses along members or, or things like that, there's a, a code that it uses. So basically, I, I, I've implemented that. Um, you will see here under the GSA solver that there are a, a group of components, that there are basically some task components, and then there's some things here to say, what do we want to extract the node at which position, or what load case, or which load task, and that type of thing. So, And again, there are, the, particularly that Galapagos script, script example, um, if, you, if you download that one and have a look, you'll see um, some of the components, because what that's taking is the displacement at the middle node of the truss. Um, and so that can give you, uh, and the nice thing with Grasshopper is you can cut and paste from one definition to another. So actually downloading and, ex and, and testing those examples that I've got on the blog, actually I should quickly show the blog as well, um, is that then you can uh, you can cut and paste into your own models or just adapt the, the model um, as you might need to. So if you go to Geometry Gym, dot blogspot dot com okay and then you'll find a whole bunch because I, I develop I've been developing a lot of BIM tools and things like that there are a few blog posts that perhaps aren't of interest if you actually scroll down you'll see there's this tag cloud so you should click on the GSA and then that will filter the blog just for the blogs that are, are specific to the GSA software so you can see here an example of actually creating a custom nerves profile for a beam or you'll find lots of grasshopper scripts that you can download and test for yourself. In terms, here's the form finding ones from your form finding webinar, Pete. So you can download these Grasshopper definitions, having installed the tools, and start to run them yourself. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, now, if I have an existing GSA model that contains some of the GSA functions that is not available, say response spectrums in Grasshopper, uh, or sorry, Geometry Gym, can I still edit the geometry of the model, or still have all the we still have all the extra functions and settings. Yeah, definitely. Um, and actually, there are. If, if I haven't implemented something, please don't hesitate to ask me to add it. Um, adding these components um, is not too big. At, you know, I can add them quite quickly. I do. I think on some of these solvers as well. You, obviously, you can manually interact with the model if you've just left it open in, in GSA, as we did here with the columns. Um, we can make whatever changes we like. It's just that doesn't actually get fed back into the Grasshopper script. But also some of them, I think some of these components, we could actually send our own custom GWA strings. So also you could actually not necessarily just use my components if I haven't written it. You can actually have a text file which has those GWA commands and they can also be sent to the GSA application if you wish. But by all means, please, as a user, don't hesitate to ask me for a new feature if it hasn't been enabled yet. Excellent. So it looks like to say thank you very much for that, John. That was that was really interesting. I I I, I really enjoyed that, and I, I know we've been getting some good, good feedback on the questions as well. And um, thank you, so thank you all for very much for attending, and for, and thank you, John, for for that presentation. Thanks very much, Peter.